Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today, our gospel reading is a continuation of the Sermon on the Plain, which we meditated on last week. And what we learned last week was how Jesus came to turn everything upside down, or at least so it seemed. Rather, he was restoring creation, restoring us to what God always intended us to be, and in his mercy, even a little bit more. It just seems backwards to us in our fallen world and our old sinful flesh wants to constantly get us to do the opposite of what Jesus has come to do. And today, our gospel reading is the next part of this teaching of Jesus. The next part, which focuses on how because Jesus has done this thing, because he has restored us and the world to the way it ought to be, through his life, death, and resurrection. Now that he has subjected death to life, now that he has given us grace and mercy where just judgment could have been applied, he's getting to our part in God's plan for the world. So what is our part? Well, to be honest, Lutherans, myself included, we have a hard time talking about our part And that's because our confession as a church was written during a time where the church's emphasis was too much on our part. Or rather, our part had the wrong sort of focus. The church was teaching that by doing good things, we were gaining favor in the eyes of God. That we were becoming more worthy to be loved by God. And last week, we learned that Jesus is the one who does that work, not us. For we cannot do anything to gain his favor. So because that was the time in which our confession of faith was written, we often have a difficult time talking about what God has now called us to because we are saved. Because we're worried about sounding like we're saying that through our deeds we become righteous in the eyes of God. So let's set the record straight on that one first. The whole purpose of the inversion of things that Jesus does, the restoration of what God intended from the beginning for our blessings and woes, for life and death and grace and justice, that was done to accomplish salvation. And it was completely finished in Jesus. Your salvation was one in him. No more work is needed on your part For the salvation of your own soul. Jesus has fully accomplished that. In fact, that's the basis of that whole first section. None of it makes any sense, as we learned in our epistle reading last week. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if he didn't do all the things he came to do, then we are a people most to be pitied because none of the stuff he says would make any sense. Those blessings would not be blessings and those woes would not be woes. In fact, it would go back to being the other way around. But thanks be to God and Christ Jesus, for he has indeed done those things. So the only reason we have a part in this story is because out of love, Christ accomplished our salvation. Out of love, he gave us his perfect righteousness freely as a gift of grace through no work of our own. That's the joyous message of the gospel. But... You and I are still here. Why? If Jesus has finished the work of salvation and I'm saved, what's the point? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? That is what Jesus is telling us today. He's talking to his disciples and he is trying to teach them that once he leaves, once he ascends into heaven, they're still going to be here and he has something for them to do. And the something for them to do is not in order to save themselves. They're already saved but because he wants more and more people to come to the knowledge of the truth. And as his followers, so do we. So this section today is a natural outgrowth of the section from last week. The work of Christ creates this place for our part in the story of God's plan for saving the world. 
So to sum it all up in one phrase, this whole section is basically calling us to live the same backwards life that Jesus himself displayed for us. Well, at least backwards in the eyes of the world. That if we follow our Lord Jesus, what you do is not going to make a whole lot of sense to them. But now we know the truth in Jesus. So Jesus does this in this section by giving us 16 imperatives. Take that for a moment there. 16 imperatives. We're only looking at 11 verses. But there are 16 imperatives. And an imperative is a verbal form of a command. So an example that you might be familiar with for the kids out there, clean your room. That's an imperative. Right? It's not a negotiation. It's not, uh, if you feel like it, clean your room. It's clean your room, right? So Jesus is commanding us. He's giving us commands on how those whom he has called are to live. Now that's a lot to go over, 16 imperatives. But really we can divide those into three sections, and each one of those sections is summed up by one particular imperative that encompasses that whole thing. And here are those three the first, of course, is the one I referenced in the children's message, the golden rule, in verse 31. And as you wish others would do to you, do so to them. The second, which summarizes the source of where we do that and how we do that, is in verse 36. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. And the last one is in verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. So the first section is all about this radical, strange way that God is calling us to live. And he doesn't pull any punches right out the gate. Here's what he says. His first imperative, his first command to you is, love your enemies. Now you've heard that a bunch of times in church, but really think about what that means. Love your enemies. That's way more than just doing good to others. Think about the last time you were the most upset you've been at someone. What Jesus is saying is, love that person in that moment. Love your enemies. It's an unnatural act of the will to resist your natural inclination to desire recompense, vengeance. Even just claiming my rights, my justice. Jesus says no. Love your enemies. Place the mercy of Christ on display in your life for their well-being above your own self-justification. And this whole section that this summarizes hammers away at our desire for our defense of self and a recognition of our own rights. The imperatives continue. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Offer petitions on behalf of those who insult you. Not only should you not demand what is right according to the law when someone strikes you or takes your outer garment, but he calls you to offer even more to them. Give them the other cheek to strike as well. Give them your inner garment too. And this is in direct opposition to the law that was given in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it says that if somebody takes your outer garment, they owe you either to give that back or to replace it with a new one. And what Jesus is calling his disciples to do is not to appeal to that law, but for the sake of the person who is stealing from you to give even more than what they take. How are you doing? Doing a good job of this in your life? I can tell you I'm not. Man, I felt very convicted reading the scripture and preparing for this sermon. Because we don't do that. Not nearly as often as we ought to. And if that's not enough, Jesus then asks some questions, some rhetorical questions, to highlight what the difference now is from your former life without him and now having been called by him in verses 32 to 34. So if you've got your bulletins, it's the top of page 8. I'm going to read those again real quick. 
And I want you to note that the, the word here that is in English says benefit is actually the Greek word for grace, charis. If you, have, if you love those who love you, what grace is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what grace is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what grace is that to you? So if it wasn't hard enough getting those eight imperatives right off the bat, he draws even more attention to the difference between the old Adam in us and the new that is now in Christ. That we're not called to just love the people we like and the people that do nice things to us, but to love our enemies and those who hate us. The second section, which is made up of four imperatives, is all about the command to imitate Christ, to imitate God. And it's an important connection to be made for the disciples who are listening to Jesus and for us. Because you're left at the end of the first section wondering, how can I even begin to do what Jesus is asking me to do? And so he says, look to my example. Know that I am the source of your life now in Christ. So these, these imperatives are love your enemies, repeated again for emphasis. Because maybe his disciples are wondering, did he really say that? So he says it a second time. Yep, I really said that. Love your enemies. Do good. Lend with no expectation of recompense. And be merciful as your father is merciful. Think about that last one for a moment. How is your father merciful to you? Are you worthy of his love? No. In fact, the Bible describes us as the enemies of God. That in our sin, we have aligned ourselves against him. So all he's doing is asking you to treat others the same way he's treated you. He loved his enemies. He prayed for them. He died for them. He redeemed them. He redeemed you. This section reinforces that for us, the source of our ability to do, even begin to do any of these things is God himself. Through the gifts that he gives us through Jesus and his Holy Spirit. Love your enemies, do good, lend with no expectation of return. Be merciful as your father is merciful. Now, the fine, and this brings us to the final section, four more commands from Jesus here. And this now answers the question, if I'm supposed to be merciful as my Father is merciful, how do I do that? He tells us, if you're going to be merciful like your Father is merciful, then do not judge, do not condemn, but rather forgive and give. Why should you do those things? Well, because this is what God in Christ has done and is doing every day for you. Just think this last week. Take a moment and think back to all of the things you've done wrong. Never mind the visible stuff that other people know about, but what about in your own mind? You know, sometimes I think, there, there's, I think there was a story I read sometime where there was like one of those scrolling billboards on everyone's forehead and it projected the thoughts that were always going on in your mind. And that sounded like the worst nightmare ever. And then you come here on Sunday each and every week and you receive the same word of forgiveness. Do not judge, do not condemn. Your heavenly father does not do so for you. For instead, he judged and condemned Jesus in your place. So what might this look like for you? It's great to talk about this in the abstract. But practically speaking, how does this play out in our lives? Okay, pastor, I know, okay, we came to, to church and we learned that Jesus saved us completely. That we're, we don't have to worry about our own salvation. But now Jesus is calling us to do something that seems impossible. 
You know, how, what does that even look like? How do I begin to even attempt? Well, I want to read something, and this is a real story, and I want to read it to you. And maybe partway through what I'm reading, you'll recognize what it is. If not, I'll share with you at the end. I do not want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you or how much you, what you've done or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just, I hope you go to God with all the guilt, all the bad things you may have done in the past. Each and every one of us may have done something we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone can say it. And again, I'm speaking for myself and not on behalf of my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did. But I personally want the best for you. And I was never going to say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best thing would be to give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person, and I don't wish anything bad on you. These words were spoken to Amber Geiger by Brant Jean, the brother of Botham Jean, who Amber unfortunately and tragically shot and killed. She entered his apartment thinking it was her own, maybe you remember hearing this news story, and killed him thinking he was an intruder. It's a totally innocent, tragic, and horrible thing. And this is his brother speaking to the person who killed his brother in court. That's what this looks like. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Offer up petitions on behalf of those who set themselves against you. What a wonderful example of the mercy of our Father. For that is what God in Christ has done for you and me. And his words serve as a wonderful real life example. I remember reading that about that the first time, and it was just so striking to me, the difference between him, who has so much more reason than anyone else to hate and to seek revenge. And he doesn't. And yet outside the courthouse, there were thousands of protesters doing exactly that. That's what we are called to, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the weird things that we're supposed to do, the radical love that we've experienced in Jesus that he calls us to live in our own lives. Not to save ourselves, he's done that. But because our Lord desires everyone to be saved, even our enemies. So he's sending you as embodiments of his mercy to live and speak that mercy into the world. So, dear friends in Christ, do to others as you wish them to do to you. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. Give, and it will be given to you. Do none of these things out of a desire to make your, yourself worthy in the eyes of God, for that has been done in Jesus. Rather, now view yourselves as possessors of that love and mercy of God and Christ. And having been called to go and share that mercy with others. You're not going to do it perfectly. And sometimes you're not going to do it well. Some of the criticisms of Christians are totally valid. We're sinners just like everyone else. And we need that same mercy and forgiveness daily from our Lord. And we're just so blessed that he does give it every day. But he still calls us to go to love in this way, to show mercy in this way. And his power is made perfect in our weakness. His power is a power for those who are imperfect. It's what makes us whole. So go out boldly without fear, 
Don't worry about the future where you might screw this up or miss an opportunity. But instead, focus on the words of Jesus today from Luke chapter 6. And strive to be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Strive to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not for your sake, but for theirs. In the name of Jesus. Amen.